Hello, BookTube. It's Wednesday, and that means Epic Comic Book Wednesday, the, the epic collaboration between myself and Michael K. Vaughn, where we combine the forces of Stately Vaughn Manor and Hyde Cottage to talk about the comic books on which we have wasted our youths. <laughs> uh, and we originally started out, as the title implies, by talking about Marvel's epic collection run, their full-color uh, paperback reprint run. Michael has a ton of those, and he started off talking about them on his channel, and I horned my way in. Uh, so uh, we talk about epic collections for Marvel, but we broaden the scope. We'll talk about Marvel, DC, all sorts of things, all sorts of characters or runs. And because I horned my way in, I let Michael pick what we're going to do from week to week. There have been weeks where I have regretted that. <laughs> there have been weeks where I haven't. Uh, Michael and I sometimes disagree, uh, and when we don't, when we do disagree... Uh, it's because he's wrong. <laughs> and today is a rare example, comparatively rare, an epic comic book. I don't know how long we've been doing this. It's so much fun for the five people who watch these videos. Today we're doing something comparatively unusual uh, because we're not talking about a comic book or a run or a superhero or a creator or anything like that. We're talking about a subject, a discussion subject. And I wasn't going to put it this way, but Michael, in his video today, I'll leave a link to his video down below as one of his inimitable thumbnails. His, the, the question that he comes up with for his video is not something that I was going to come right out and ask, but it is a really good question. And that question is, did Stan Lee ruin superhero comics? And as Michael points out in his video, that it seems like a howlingly wrong question. If anybody saved superhero comics, it was Stan Lee. Uh, all, all the people who think about superhero comics at all think about them synonymously with the name of Stan Lee, who introduced relevance and character conflict, who shaped superhero comics into what he famously referred to as the world outside your window, uh, and started it off, kicked things off with Fantastic Four number one. Uh, I have a less rosy picture of Stan Lee. I think the man himself was a genius. And I have loved a lot of the stuff that he has done. A lot of the stuff that he has overseen, even when he wasn't writing the scripts himself. I have loved those things a lot. I am not saying that. I Michael has all of the $150, you know, 1,000-page hardcover omnibus editions. But I have read, <coughs> I won't say every issue of Marvel Comics from the moment when they first appeared, because I gave the Hulk a wide berth. I've always been a little bit bored with Iron Man. But... Most of the, the Hallmark staple Marvel comics I have been reading since the first issue that they appeared, and lovingly rereading them as well. So I'm not, I'm not saying that Stan Lee was a fraud or, or any kind of a lightweight. I mean, he was, I, I firmly believe, one of the 20th century's great creative innovators. Just full stop. Not just in comics or in publishing, but... If you came up with a list of such figures in especially the late 20th century, the second half of the 20th century, his name would have to be on that list. And that would be true even if Hollywood hadn't fully embraced that concept. The last, the last, of the last $6 trillion made by Hollywood over the last 20 years, $5 trillion have been made by Marvel products. That is a huge thing that has made these creations of Stan Lee household names. So I'm not, I'm not denying any of that. I've got a lot of value out of a lot of value, as the ProTube channel say. I've got a lot of love. I love a lot of Stan Lee productions. Nevertheless, when Michael says that it's just possible that Stan Lee saved comics, he is, in fact, wrong. <laughs> Stan Lee introduced psychology and daily relevance and a kind of ever-changing, internally consistent continuity to superhero comics where all three of those things do not belong. <laughs> where, in fact, not only do they not belong there, but their presence changes the whole alchemy of the thing into something that is totally unsustainable. 100% unsustainable. Comics, superhero comics, are a static medium. You open the comic, uh, Mary Marvel has someone to fight, that someone is connected with a mystery that is unfolding in her civilian life. In Mary Batson's civilian life, there is a mystery unfolding. Mary Batson has to figure out that mystery, and when it comes, when push comes to shove, she will transform into Mary Marvel, and Mary Marvel will physically solve that problem, those evildoers. And when it's done, she waves an invulnerable finger at the bad guys, lectures them just a bit, and then the comic ends. And you have spent 
you know, five cents and your five cents has been well spent. You have had another Merry Marvel adventure. And next month, you will have another one. <laughs> and then one after that. Same thing with the, the big red cheese, Captain Marvel. You will, one month, you will open his comic and he will be fighting Ibak. And you will wonder how that's going to go. How is he going to outwit Ibak? Ibak can't hurt him. No one can hurt him. That's the whole point of being Captain Marvel. No one can hurt him. It's not. It's not a question of you know. Is someone going? To, is a villain going to manage to amputate one of his fingers or anything like and and eat it in front of him? In a modern version, that's what would happen. It's not a question of that. It's a question of how is he going to outsmart Ibac? How is Superman going to outsmart Brainiac? Brainiac can't hurt him. Even the criminals from the from the neutral from the Phantom Zone can't hurt him any more than he can hurt them. It's going to come down to a clever plot. It's going to come down to a, a clever little adventure. And when it's over, you will have had that clever adventure with some of your favorite characters, and then you will close the comic and go on about your business. <laughs> and then the next month, another such adventure will occur, and you will read it and enjoy it, and that will be that. And that is the pure form of comics. That is what they should be. And Stanley thought, nah, that's not good enough for me. I want to introduce melodrama. He cut his teeth writing melodrama for... Uh, well, romance comics, Western comics, monster comics, and he thought, you know, I'm going to bring that to superhero comics. It's not present in the Distinguished Competition. It's not present in DC Comics. I want to add that. So I'm going to create a super team, the Fantastic Four. Their powers aren't going to be anything to write home about. But that's not the point. The point is they don't necessarily automatically work well together or even like each other. And I'm going to draw a lot of drama from that. And Stan Lee was a very good, capable, melodramatic author. So when he thought to do that, it worked. Uh, not everyone can do that so well, but I remember reading those early issues of Fantastic Four and thinking, well, okay, this is entertaining, but what on earth? The characters in the team don't even like each other? <laughs> what on earth? What is that? That, that there are plenty of, You've had plenty of jobs where you don't like all your coworkers. Do you really want to read about that in a superhero comic? How sustainable is that? Uh, it turns out it's not. <laughs> my, one of my main contentions about the so-called relevance or uh, psychological realism that Stanley introduced into Marvel Comics and that leached its way into DC Comics once it proved popular is that it's not sustainable. No matter no matter how much you champion it as being just what so many people wanted. <laughs> Michael K. Vaughn's video, I am characterized as a lonely despot of Latveria, the only person in the world who still wants comics to be static where everybody else doesn't. But is that true? Is that really true? Michael points out in his own video that whenever either company makes a major change to a character, it inevitably slowly changes back to what it was. The Fantastic Four might not have liked each other in that first issue. They might have gone through periods where a writer comes on board and wants to take them back to their roots by having some members not like others. They eventually come back around to liking each other. That's just, there is a static equilibrium that no one can deny. If you say in, in a comic book that, well, Superman, the last son of the planet Krypton, uh, gets his superpowers from, from low, Earth's low gravity and super energizing yellow sun. Only we're going to change that so that now he's made of electricity. He's blue and he's made of electricity. When you see that happen in a Superman comic, if you're a fan reading along, you know one thing before anything else, which is that in a year at the most, he's going to be back to being what he was. It's not going to be permanent. Well, why does that? Why is that? Why does that happen? It's because the medium itself is static. You are working against its own nature to introduce fundamental changes. And I would argue, and apparently if Michael's right, I'm the last person on earth to argue, you're also removing a good deal of fun. It's, it is a sign of a poor writer, a weak poet, to look at a Petrarchan sonnet form and say, I'm going to have to abandon that form because I want to do X, Y, and Z. I can't do what I want in that form. Despite how many hundreds of people before me have done what I want in that form and made it brilliant. Despite that fact, I can't do that. I need to break the form. I'm sorry, I just have to do that. That is not the mark of a creative genius. That's the mark of a weak person. A weak creative talent will do that. They're the only ones who ever even want to. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, again, I want to stress, I am not saying that Marvel Comics in this under this ethos has been worthless far from it michael and i've talked about a million marvel comics runs particular titles particular story arcs that we undeniably love both of us the same we both read them and reread them many many times that's happened to me quite a bit and for many many years over the last 60 years or so 
When I went to my dry goods store or my stationery store or my bookstore or once they appeared, de devoted comic book shops, to get that week's new releases. If I was in the country, I would go and get that week's new releases. And on many, many, many of those weeks, probably the majority of those weeks, the bulk of those issues were Marvel. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be a heretic here. I'm merely trying to say uh, that every time Marvel tries to do this kind of crap, it usually fails. There will be standout arcs, standout creators, standout moments that don't fail. But it usually does because when you introduce psychological verisimilitude and psychological stakes, what inevitably follows? If you are a fan of soap operas, you know what inevitably follows. You have to keep upping the stakes. You have to do it. Every new writer is going to want to outdo the old writers in that way. And that inevitably leads to absurdity. It inevitably leads to the stereotypical comic, rea uh, comic exaggeration for daytime soap operas is that a character makes a, tum a tumultuous return and in the writer's room they're saying, well, wait a minute, he was decapitated. <laughs> in the previous storyline, he was decapitated. How can you make a tumultuous return? That is an absurd version, but nevertheless, it turns out to be the case in superhero comics that if you've got a villain and he displays his villainy by robbing a bank, it, once you introduce the Stan Lee virus, he can't display his villainy by robbing a bank the next time he shows up. He's got to rob a whole syndicate of banks, or he's got to kill everybody in the bank while he's robbing it, or he's got to make a plan to kill everybody in the world, or maybe turn them into mind-controlled zombies who will pluck out their, their spouse's eyes and eat them in front of their spouse and enjoy it. I'll use my mental telepathy to make them not only eat their spouse's eyes, but enjoy it. <sighs> In other words, quickly you get The Authority, which is a comic book that Mar Michael and I will certainly be talking about in due time. You, you quickly get into a downward spiral of sordid, mentally deranged absurdity solely generated by the desire, the built-in desire, to keep upping the ante. The only reason that you want to do that, the only reason that's part of the equation is because of Stan Lee. So when Michael says, well, some of the later iterations of that urge to up the ante were bad, definitely bad. You can't blame Stan Lee for that. That's like saying, well, some of the later stages of influenza, right before you die, are really bad. No doubt about it. But you can't blame the virus for that. <laughs> of course you can't. I do blame Stan Lee. There was nothing wrong with DC Comics when he took that, that formula and warped it. And you might be thinking, well, okay, if that's true, then you must be able to detect when the organism was infected. And maybe some of you are thinking that this whole rant was sparked by that z patient zero infection point, which is the death of Gwen Stacy, which Michael and I covered in our last video. We, we covered the death of Gwen Stacy, a Spider-Man comic, in which the Green Goblin knocks an unconscious Gwen Stacy, Peter Parker's girlfriend, off the top of the Brooklyn Bridge. Spider-Man, desperate to save her life, shoots webbing to attach to her as she's falling. And the, abrupt, the webbing abruptly stops her, and it snaps her neck. So although uh, the Green Goblin is the proximate cause of her death, we're given a superhero comic in which the immediate cause of the heroine's death is the hero. <laughs> and then, realistically, it doesn't happen in that run of Spider-Man, but realistically, then what would follow? Peter Parker may on some level know that he was the immediate cause. He certainly has to deal with grief and rage, and it might derange him, and he's still putting on a costume. He's still not regulated by any government ability. He can still bend steel in his bare hands. In, in, the writer, Jerry Conway, doesn't follow up with the death of Grand Stacey. Weirdly, he doesn't do that. But in reality, he certainly would. I mentioned it in that last video where Spider-Man, fresh from his grief, he's still grieving for Gwen Stacy. She is still in the morgue. He is accosted by Luke Cage, Power Man, who has been hired by J. Jonah Jameson to attack Spider-Man. In not just the modern iteration, the late, the 21st century iteration of Marvel superhero comics, but also in real life, that circumstance would have caused Peter Parker, Spider-Man, to kill Luke Cage or hospitalize him or permanently injure him. That's what would have happened. That would have been the outlet that I didn't know I was bottling all of this up. You attacked me out of nowhere. I've only vaguely heard of you. I have no idea what your beef is, but I can easily destroy you in battle, and that's what I'm going to do. And maybe later on down the line, Peter Parker would have a realization, oh my God, what kind of a thing have I turned into? I need help, something like that. None of that happens. But you're introducing those inevitabilities when you introduce the idea that not only would a major character die, but that 
the immediate cause of her death would be the hero of the book. Spider-Man effectively kills her. I read that issue when it first came out and thought, all right, this is really well done, but I don't want this in comics. I don't want this to be the world of superhero comics. So you might be thinking that that moment is what kicked off this whole thing that I'm criticizing and that Michael was, was kind of sort of praising in his own video. But that's not true. The infection point happens much earlier than the death of Gwen Stacy. And I have it all keyed up for you. I remembered it. In fact, I thought this at the time when I bought this thing. What did I pay for it? 12 cents. I bought this at the time, and I remember when I finished it thinking exactly that, thinking, okay, the Fantastic Four not liking each other was one thing. The Hulk being kind of a jerk is one thing. But this, this is a disastrous precedent. You can, if you do this once, you are doomed to doing this forever. Uh, and the, the inflection point is this. It's Avengers number 13. But a classic Jack Kirby cover there, that is Count Nefaria. He is introduced in this book. He is a seedy middle Europe nobleman. Probably bought his title. Uh, he's, not, he's not anybody the Avengers would realistically ever even notice, but he invites them to his mansion, and they accept his invitation. They're very flattered by it. They don't know that he's the leader of Marvel's answer to the Mafia. They have no idea when, they, when the adventure starts that that's true. And they have no idea that Count Nefaria, despite his name, <laughs> I think the name would tip them off, but they have no idea that he has a nefarious plan to hypnotize them and while they're hypnotized, duplicate them and make the duplicates into villains. That's what happens in the course of this issue. And when the duplicates go on a rampage, uh, when, the, you know, when the, 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 the evil Avengers go on a rampage, the governments of the world immediately turn against them, declare them outlaws, and declare, we're told, just offhandedly martial law. The Fantastic Four appear in this issue. They want to. They hear the Avengers have gone rogue, and they want to step in. It's natural. They have the ability to, to step in where the U.S. government does not. And they are specifically told by a man who enters their their headquarters. He says, "My past this paper from the Pentagon lets me go anywhere I want. I don't need security to get into your building." He tells them, "You are forbidden from going after the Avengers because the fear is that." the public reaction against the Avengers will endanger any super beings who go out in public. In other words, a classic example where Stan Lee opens a can of worms he has no intention of cooking or eating. What is the fallout of this? It's, there's a neat little bow put on it at the end, but what is the fallout of the, of the American public suddenly becoming not only afraid of, but angry with this brand new super team, and by extension all other super teams? That should have been a year's worth of stories. Just the fallout of that alone. But it instead is dressed up in a bow at the end of this issue. But the uh, the Avengers eventually, you know, wake up and figure out what's going on and defeat Count Nefaria in his castle. With the help of the Teen Brigade, Rick Jones and a bunch of teenagers who were responsible for the original formation of the Avengers and who hang around for the, this first year of the title just, you know, bobby socksing and whatever. I have no idea why they were incredibly annoying to me, even when I was reading this, when everyone dressed the way they do. Some sort of stupid, half-hearted sop towards what the kids like. Uh, the, the kids were buying these issues and loving them, but they weren't loving them for the team brigade, that's for sure. Stanley just didn't know that. He didn't trust his own storytelling ability. But the thing that really bothered me about this issue bothered me right from the front cover. I don't know if you can make it out there. See, you've got the, the classic little blurbs everywhere, the castle of Count Nefaria and whatnot. But there's this little thing up here. Let me read it to you. It says, you'll gasp in amazement at the most unexpected final panel you've ever seen. There's a very good reason why that final panel is unexpected, because it had never been done before, and shouldn't have been done. We get to the end of the issue. I'll just page along as I talk to you. We get to the end of the issue. The Avengers are hoodwinked by Count Nefaria. They are duplicated. They are public enemy number one. They actually fight the army in the course of the issue. Uh, that apparently is, you know, uh, will make amends. It's no big deal. They figure out what's going on. They fight Count Nefaria in his castle, and they fight his, his uh, gangland goons, who are uh, caught up in a net by Giant Man. Uh, see, they, let me show you. Let me show you so you don't think I'm making this up. They run onto the scene and ac accidentally trample onto a net. Before that, they have been routed uh, by Captain America. See, they're running towards him. Those goons are running towards him, and he routes them easily, as he would, right? I want to show you those panels because there's something that's not in those panels that I want to point out to you. But first, I'll show you the panels first. They are thwarted. 
Uh, the army general who made his way into the Baxter building apparently has made his way into Count Nefarious Castle. Maybe his papers work even there. He shows up just as a terrified Count Nefaria is confessing to the Avengers everything that he did. He's just squealing like a pig. He's singing like a canary. And the, the general says, uh, Captain America says, have you heard enough? And the general says, yes, Captain America, I believe I have. I should have known the Avengers could never be guilty of treason. And as for you, Count Nefaria, there's no place for you here. You'll be deported at once. <laughs> they, just, they just deport this Euro trash. They don't do anything else about him. That's how they deal with this supervillain who has the technology to duplicate Avengers and make the army turn on uh, and uh, that is the end of the issue you would think okay well that'd be great and if that were the end of the issue Steve even Steve would have no problem with it but that's not the shocking final panel the shocking final panel is this that is the beginning of the Stan Lee virus in Marvel Comics for which from which Marvel and DC Comics are still suffering today that is the origin point of it Giant Man looks down at the helpless, unconscious form of his girlfriend, Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp. As Rick Jones says, during the fighting, a stray bullet hit her. Just a one in a million chance. She, she was trying to protect us. It all happened so fast. And that's the end of the issue. That's the final panel. Where in the midst of this confrontation with this dumb B-rate villain, an Avenger has actually been shot. A bullet with a bullet, with a gun, an Avenger has been shot, and she is unconscious and apparently dying. That's how the issue ends. Now, the small point I want to make here, a very small point, I won't dwell on it, is that no one in Castle Nefaria has guns. I've shown you two panels, the only two panels that we see, the roustabout, the mafia roustabouts who are at Count Nefaria's beck and call, do not use guns. There is no gunfire in this issue that doesn't come from U.S. troops out on the battlefield. <laughs> there's, there's no gunfire in Count, in Count Nefarious Castle. That is Stan Lee going out of his way to injure a superhero. Uh, and the whole of the next issue is them frantically trying to find the one lung spread. The bullet hits her lung, and she's dying. She has two, uh, she, two days left to live. So it's, this is not a flesh wound. The Avengers have merely two days to find the one lung specialist in the world who can save her. Because as Thor, of all people, tells the other Avengers, miracles do sometimes happen. He's a god. <laughs> He's a god. Hank Pym's uh, potion that he uses to shrink and grow presumably can also shrink or grow a bullet inside his girlfriend. Does he do it? No. Iron Man has access to, uh, to technology that is literally keeping his heart pumping. Does he use any of that or even think to? No. Thor is a god. <laughs> he has access to the apples of immortal youth in Asgard, as well as any other source of abilities in Asgard. Does he think to use them? No. Instead, they have to go after this, this Norwegian doctor, who's the one person in the world who has the ability to save Janet Van Dyne, and somehow Thor finds him. He takes off across the ocean, and somehow, we're told, his hammer detects this doctor and, and allows him to find the guy in his laboratory. And as he's grabbing the guy, saying, you're, you're coming with me, no, you're, no ifs, ands, or buts, the, the, uh, the doctor that he grabs up says, uh, what? What nonsense is this? Put me down, you lunatic. You don't know what you're doing. I'm not the man you think. You're making a mistake. Does he follow up with that? He says, put me down. You're making a mistake. Thor isn't saying anything in response. And we are told in the next panel that it takes an hour for them to fly back to the United States. In that hour, does the man Thor has in his arms maybe elaborate on what he means by I'm not the man you think I am? Apparently not, because it's only in the next panel that he turns out to be a space alien. <laughs> He's not that doctor at all, and apparently he doesn't elaborate enough on that. He doesn't, for instance, follow up, I'm not the man you think I am, with I'm actually a space alien here, let me take off my mask. He doesn't do that <laughs> in the course of so it, 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 the, the story goes on and on the Avengers eventually have to face these aliens in order to find this one doctor who can do the job and they find him and he operates on Janet Van Dyne and again like in the previous issue we get a last panel reveal he steps out of the operating room and he looks grim and the Avengers are all tense they don't know uh, what's going to happen they have no idea and then he quietly says the operation was successful. The girl will recover. Uh, and the Avengers are 
are tremendously relieved. Let us now leave the Avengers. Strong men should not be seen with tears in their eyes, nor should they be disturbed as they lift their faces heavenward in solemn, grateful thanksgiving. And that was the most that Stanley was willing to do. Look at how the, the very next issue starts. <laughs> there she is. There's the wasp. She was shot in the lung, presumably at point-blank range. She was saved at the last minute by a pulmonary expert. She should be recovering for a year. <laughs> and maybe, if she's a normal person, renouncing the idea of ever being a superhero again. She's a New York socialite. She's, she stands to inherit. She's daddy's little girl. We would, in a, in a psychologically real world, we would expect that her being shot and almost killed in some weird count's weird castle would change her mind about being a superhero. But instead, she's just there. No allusion is made to it ever again. And that is... Uh, the beginning of this nonsense. That's where it began. Is that you now know when you read this issue here? Let me get back to the uh, to the deadly panel in question. When you now read an issue of the Avengers, uh, you now know that this is possible. And if it can happen to the Wasp, it can happen to anybody. Characters can be tortured. They can be mutilated. They can be simply beaten even long after they are unconscious. Uh, they can be raped. They can be inseminated. <laughs> anything can happen once you break that barrier. Once you do that, not only is anything possible, but everything has to be possible because everyone who comes along is going to want to up the ante. Everyone is. And who wants that? Do you want that in your comics? I know you've read as many of these that you liked as I have, but if you sit back and think about it, do you want that? Do you want to escape into a comic book story by wondering whether or not one of your favorite characters is going to get shot in the head? <laughs> it happens in Marvel and DC Comics all over the place now. It makes the cover. Gone are the days when, when the cover would be discreet enough not to show it. In a present-day Avengers story in which an Avenger is mutilated or shot or tortured in some way, it would be shown on the cover. You wouldn't have to wait for a last panel reveal. And you might be asking, if you are a total Marvel zombie, if you have been in totally inculcated by this particular iteration of what superhero comics should be, then you might be wondering, you know, if you're young, uh, younger than I am, which is pretty much everybody, you might be wondering, well, what would even the alternative be? I'll tell you what the alternative would be. The alternative would be what the comics that DC was putting out while this issue was going to the stands. Comics in which, as I mentioned, every issue is a self-contained story. There are no cliffhanger panels at the end. Every story features the hero trying to figure out a way to outwit the villain. It never comes down to a question of strength. Whether or not the hero's solution, what if Superman comes up with it, a solution to the prankster's latest trick, his ability to enforce that solution will come down to force. Even Green Arrow and his sidekick Speedy will eventually be able to simply beat up the bad guys. But first, the point of the story will be figuring out the clever gimmick. Once it's figured out, and the hero, if they're non-powered, they escape a trap. If they're powered, they figure it out and are there waiting for when it happens again. Once that happens, everything goes back to normal. Everything goes back to the way it was before. The costumes are different, but all the heroes have the same personality, which is no personality. And you might be thinking, well, how satisfying can that be if the characters don't have any personality? Because you have a personality, and I have a personality, and your friends have personalities. You know who else has personalities? Jerks have personalities. The jerk at your office has a personality. And if you introduce them into superhero comics, who's to say that your team might not have jerks on it? Might not have people who have bad personalities instead of good ones? Better to leave them out completely. <laughs> Better to leave them for the real world that you have to live in anyway. Since you have to live in that world anyway, who wants to see the world outside your window when you go to a superhero comic? It's not like these things are, you know, a comic book version of the life of Harriet Tubman. As Michael points out, they have aliens, superpowers, monsters. If that's already true, why would you go into these things being such a masochist that you would want verisimilitude? Why would you want that? <laughs> I know this is breaching to the wind because Marvel has so thoroughly dominated the whole of the world that there's no point in calling no, comics are never going to go back to what I'm talking about never the closest that they come are the things that I used to love throughout the 90s and the early 2000s I used to love them you would have these gigantic comic book series glumping along uh, I don't know, uh, Wonder Woman, Wonder Girl has been rendered blind, or someone has amputated her head, or something like that. And there's a long storyline about, you know, uh, 
how can we find the head again? How can we reattach it? Is she going to have long-standing psychological drama that we're going to have to take the reader through? Yeah, because that's nice and entertaining. The whole time that those plot lines were going on, DC Comics was also bringing out uh, comic books that were really well done, they were really well drawn, really well written, that reflected the animated version, the animated world where their characters were also appearing. It, it was a lot of, for a long time, that was called The Adventures of Superman. There was The Adventures of Batman and Robin, where you could hunt for them. They were usually down below in the new release section where the comics for kids are. But they weren't for kids. They were for everybody, which is what comics used to be. It's what comics were for their first 50 years. They were for everybody. And those issues were great. There were a whole bunch of them. There was a whole run of Justice League. There was a whole bunch ongoing titles of Superman. I don't know if that still exists. That might still exist. Something like that might still exist. The, some of those Batman issues were worthy of Eisner's. They were so good. And they weren't continued, and you weren't worried that Batman wasn't going to get to the warehouse in time so a bomb was going to go off and kill Robin. You weren't worried that that was going to happen because that wouldn't happen in a superhero comic. Those comics I miss, I don't know if they still exist, but I know that Marvel makes nothing like them. And I'd be willing to bet that DC, having got on this train of, you know, how can I gross you out even more next, also doesn't make them anymore. But I miss them. Just as I miss the comics they consciously imitated, the comics that I love, where we, the hero has to figure out what's going on and fix it. And when it's done... They're laughing at the villains, and they have a smile on their face. Everybody has a smile on their face. They do. The cops do. The city, the chief police does. The military does. The only person who's frowning, and he's frowning very melodramatically, is the villain, who's going off to prison, but only for a couple of weeks, until he breaks out and comes up with another harebrained scheme. Now, in Michael's video, he characterizes that as a passe way to enjoy comics. Okay. <laughs> it could very well be. But if, if I had to choose between that and this, I'll choose that every day of the week. So it, so my ultimate answer to, to Michael's excellent question, did Stan Lee ruin superhero comics, is a resounding yes, he did. <laughs> no matter how much good came from that, no matter how much good came from that ruin, he still ruined them. Because <laughs> no one will go back to that now. No one ever will. Instead, you introduce the virus of the world outside your window and constantly need to up the ante. So uh, a villain doesn't desecrate Br Bruce Wayne's parents' grave anymore. He digs up their bodies, their rotting bodies, their 30 years rotting bodies, and holds them over, uh, in suspension over a pit. <laughs> and you're not supposed to ask, what would that do psychologically to Batman instead? Or Batman is, is uh, abducted by a cult, held underground, tortured systematically. We're not supposed to ask. Yeah, it doesn't matter that the news is full of stories like that. You want that in your comics as well crazy absolutely crazy but i'm resigned to it <laughs> i think i'm going to get more of it in, in wednesday comics so you'll be right alongside you'll have a ringside seat for what i think is on some level a fundamental disagreement between michael Kavon and myself i think if we were ever to have a, a zoom chat about these subjects we'd find that he probably agrees with a little bit more of what i'm saying uh than an absolute stance he doesn't think that stanley ruined superhero comics but he admits in his video that quite a lot of bad stuff came from that Quite a lot of bad habits that all of superhero comics have now fallen into and show no signs of shaking off. I'm not sure that he would ever want to go back to the, to the Garden of Eden that I'm describing, but he might like a little more of it. <laughs> he might like to go back to a little more of it. Oh, we'll, who knows what we'll do next week? I doubt it'll be another conceptual thing. We'll probably go back to talking about uh, a team or a run or a creator or something like that. And the five of you who are still around will be right on board. <laughs> so I'll see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.